So let's see if we can cover some of the causes of breast cancer. Now you can see I put a question mark there because actually we do not know the cause of breast cancer. And the trouble is there is not going to be one cause. There'll be lots of different things that have to happen over time one after the other in order to make a normal cell in the breast become a cancerous cell. And we don't really know deep down right in the middle of the cell where all the proteins and genes are, we don't really understand what those changes are. So the first thing is there is no single cause. Some of you might remember a few years ago, there was an article in the newspaper saying there are 10 different sorts of breast cancer. Well, there aren't. There are probably as many different sorts of breast cancer as ladies that I see with it. And what you need to remember is breast cancer is not one disease. It's lots of diseases that happen to occur in the breast and everybody's breast cancer will be different. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can individualize the treatment. Now, having said we don't know the causes, there are some things that you can look that influence an individual's risk of breast cancer. I'm going to come back as well and talk a little about risk because that's a really difficult concept. Um, and the media and the newspapers really take advantage of this to make things look actually worse than they really are. Now, when we talk about the risk factors for breast cancer, so these are not causes, they're just things associated with an increase or decrease risk. There are two broad groups. Now on the left hand side, as you look, there are what we call the intrinsic factors. Now these are things that you have no control over. They're things that are happening normally and you can't do anything about it. So the obvious thing is that breast cancer is a disease of older ladies. So if you're a female and if you're older, your risk of breast cancer is much higher. We'll look at that in more detail. And then you have a whole lot of these intrinsic, what we call ovarian factors. Now, all of these seem to relate to the number of normal ovulatory cycles a lady has in her lifetime. So if your periods start young and they finish late and you don't have any children, you have more cycles and your risk is higher. And again, we're going to talk about risk in a minute. If you have children, but you have your child late, that means your risk is slightly increased. And if you have your children young, particularly in late teens, I'm not necessarily going to recommend that, but that does reduce your risk slightly. If you're breastfeeding, you tend not to have periods. So again, the number of cycles go down. So that would actually reduce your risk a bit. So if you don't breastfeed, your risk might go up a little bit. So all those things somehow relate to the number of normal cycles a lady has, but we don't really understand how that affects the cells and how it makes one of them turn strange and become cancerous. The other big thing you can't control are your genes, and we'll talk about those in a little bit more detail, and most of you are aware of a couple of what we would call major breast cancer genes. that are called the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, and we'll talk about those in a bit more detail. Now on the right-hand side, you can see what we call the extrinsic factors. And these are things you can probably do something about. And it won't surprise you that it's the same three things at the top that affect almost every cancer risk you can think of. And I'm afraid that's being overweight and for breast cancer, it's particularly being overweight at the menopause. Smoking increases the risk of every cancer we know about. There are also going to be things in the diet that we don't understand. Now, when I talk about that, I usually give the example of in Japan, where their diet is very different. They have a very high incidence of stomach cancer. They actually have a stomach cancer screening program in Japan, but their risk of breast cancer is low. If they move to the West, by the time the second generation Westerners, their risk of stomach cancer is almost gone and their risk of breast cancer has come up. Now, in Japan, they have pollution, nuclear power stations, we'll mention that again, overhead electric cables, all these things they have. The major difference is the diet. So there must be something in that, again, we don't understand that can somehow affect your risk. But remember, it's not the cause. There are lots of different causes that have to act together. And the same with envir environmental factors. And again, we'll talk about family history risk, but we know, for example, that even if we can't find any abnormal genes and there's breast cancer in your family, because you've been brought up in the same area, perhaps eaten the same food, been in the same environment, something is increasing your risk very slightly. We will look at alcohol in a little bit more detail because that was 
uh, in the papers quite a lot recently, and also HRT. Um, I'll put that in brackets next to zinc factor because obviously it's hormones that you take, but it's difficult to work out whether HRT really does affect your risk of breast cancer. Every time I see a paper that says it does, I see another one that says it doesn't. But I think at the moment we have to accept it probably does a bit, but not as much as you'd expect. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail as well. I think it's also worth talking about some things that really don't increase the risk of breast cancer, even if in the past they've been raised with things that do. And it is things like antiperspirant. There is no evidence that increases the risk of breast cancer. There was an article a few years ago and it very simply said that because you put antiperspirants under your arm and most breast cancers occur towards the upper outer part of the breast, antiperspirants must be causing cancer. Now it just happens that most of the gland tissue is in the upper outer part of the breast, so that's why most cancers here. There is no link between antiperspirants of any sort and breast cancer. Similarly, coffee doesn't cause it either, nor does hair dye nor does overhead electric cables, all wearing underwired bras, which was again brought up as something that might cause it, nor does shift working. Again, for a while we thought that might do, but it's now been proven that it hasn't. Now I put breast implants and mammograms in brackets. Breast implants don't increase the risk of cancer of the breast, but there is this thing that you may have heard about called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which is related to the implant. Now, if you have implants, you have a one in 30,000 chance of getting this rare, potentially quite curable cancer, but it's not a breast cancer, it is a lymphoma. So it does increase the risk of that by a tiny amount, but it's not a breast cancer related thing. Mammograms are more difficult because mammograms are x-rays, even though they are deliberately very low dose x-rays, so you can have lots of them. And you actually get about 10 mammograms to an ordinary chest x-ray and about 25 for a CT scan. So I've actually had two CT scans in the last 10 years, which is equivalent to 50 years worth of mammograms, and I'm not in any way fussed. But technically, and in theory, it only takes one X-ray particle, or whatever they are, to hit a cell at the wrong angle to make it go funny. But you can get that from a transatlantic flight, from a cosmic ray, from Cornish house bricks, which tend to be a little bit radioactive. So the risk is very low, and the other thing about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, mammograms is we tend to only do them after you're 40 and what we call the latent period. So the time from a, an X-ray particle hitting the cell in the breast and making it funny is decades. So if you have a mammogram at 40, you may never know about it. So although in theory, a mammogram could cause a breast cancer, in practice, looking at the figures and so on, mammograms actually save about 1300 lives a year from detecting breast cancer early. So you have to balance all that up. But in theory, it might do. In practice, it doesn't. And mammograms are quite safe. All right, so we're going to talk about risk. And the trouble is, you get bombarded with the press with things like that. HRT can double the risk of breast cancer, which sounds really scary. Or abortion triples the breast cancer risk. Or you get things like it's linked to your height. Um, on there's the one that, that we had that a drink a day raises breast cancer risk. If you're not careful, you can end up with this mocked up Daily Mail that says reading the paper gives you cancer. So you've got to think a little bit about what risk really means and bear with me on this because it's quite complicated. The first thing you have is what we call the absolute risk. So this is the risk of something actually happening in your lifetime, although most of the time it may not. So when I started training in Cambridge in 1980, hmm, the, the risk of a lady who was born in 1980, mid 1980s, of getting breast cancer was one in 14. That was their absolute risk, which means to 13 ladies out of 14, it never happened. The risk now, interestingly, is about one in nine, and it's a true increase. It's not that we're better at picking it up, but a, a, a female born now will have a one in nine chance of getting can breast cancer in their lifetime. So the risk factors are changing and it's probably, if you remember those extrinsic risk factors, the alcohol, the smoking and being overweight, those are probably the big three that have led to the increase in breast cancer risk. But again, in eight people out of nine, it never actually happens. So that's the absolute risk. Now, what the papers like to play with is the thing called this relative risk. 
And this is how much more or less likely something is going to occur in one group compared with another. So it's with people who've been exposed to something or people who haven't and so on. It's a relative risk. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples about that in a minute. But the important thing is the relative risk tells you absolutely nothing about your lifetime chance of actually developing breast cancer. It's almost a mathematical trick, if you like. So the absolute risk is a chance of you getting something throughout your entire life. And the relative risk is how much more likely or less you are to get something compared with somebody else who may have done slightly different or have been exposed to slight, something slightly different. And so this is the bit that the papers play with that can make it sound much worse than it is. But remember, relative risk doesn't actually tell you anything about how likely you are to get something. A couple of examples, if we may. From 2012, this article came out saying CT scans in childhood can triple the chance of developing brain cancer and also actually leukemia, they said, which when you think, gosh, three times the risk. Now, actually, that's a 200 percent increase. You think, oh, three. So already it begins to get confusing. So having CT scans as a child trebles the risk not only of brain tumors, also of leukemia. But look at the figures. So 0.4 children age 0 to 9 in, in 10, th in a, sorry, in 100,000 develop brain tumours and 0 0.6 in 100,000 develop leukaemia. So they're really, really rare diseases. And what that means is if you happen to have a CT scan, it's one additional case of leukaemia and one additional brain tumour for every 10,000 children having a CT scan. So one in 10,000 is an absolute, but when they do it with the relative risk, it sounds much more scary. And this is why you have to be careful. And here's the other one. So in 2011, you'll remember the tsunami hit the Fukushima nuclear reactor. And this figure came out. There was a 70% increase in female cancers after the Fukushima nuclear accident. And that was in The Guardian because the relative risk, remember, that tells you nothing about whether you get it or not, rose from 0.77 to 1.29%, which is technically a 7% increase. Interesting, the Wall Street Journal said there was a 0.5% increase, which is the absolute increase, which is very small. What was really interesting and quite amusing is that when they read each other's headlines, they both changed them around after seeing the other one to try and look more scary or less real or more realistic. But you can see how by using a relative risk, you can get a much higher figure, which looks much worse and may never really happen. What is actually in Fukushima, everybody worries about that bit in nuclear accident. There was one person who probably died from radiation exposure who developed lung cancer. Nobody else died in the incident because of the evacuation and all the rush and so on. 573 people died evacuating the area, not because of the damage to the nuclear reactor, but just by trying to escape the area. So again, you've got to be careful how you talk about these things. So relative risk and absolute risk. They're not related. One looks scary, one doesn't. So let's go back to the risk of developing breast cancer by age. And you can see if you're up to 25, you have a one in 15,000 risk of developing breast cancer before you're 25. So if, for example, you had something that doubled your relative risk, that would be still be only one in seven and a half thousand, except that it may never happen. You look at the bottom row, that's where you get your lifetime risk of one in nine, but it's still only one in 10 as you get older. And the big leap, as you can see, is between 40 and 50 when it becomes more common. So breast cancer under 40 is very rare, not particularly rare in your 40s, and then it gets more common, not surprising, as you get older, because as we said, breast cancer, like most cancers, is a disease of older ladies. But the relative risk would come at looking at ladies at 40, looking at ladies at 50, and again, if you if you increase your relative risk, you might be increasing a one in 200 to one in 150, which is still relatively small. Now, we had to think about alcohol. The thing about alcohol was an alcoholic drink could increase the relative risk of breast cancer by 5%. Now, bearing in mind when we looked at the Fukushima figures, there's a relative risk of 70%, and the actual absolute risk was very small. So you can see already the absolute risk is going to be really quite small. However, breast cancer is much more common than the childhood cancers we talked about. And quite a lot of women drink regularly and have a glass of wine. And very few of them have CT scans. So it could equate 
to 50 women in 10,000 that have a drink every day developing breast cancer. Now that sounds a bit more, but of course you've still got to pick your 10,000 women. And if they're having screening and mammograms, and we'll talk about that as well, you pick them up early and the earlier you pick them up, you can cure it. But again, it's not as big as it sounds. And again, remember, alcohol is not the cause of breast cancer. And actually, we don't really know. It's Dame Sally Davis, who's now Master of Trinity College where I trained, um, who was a chief medical officer at the time. But actually, we just don't know. And it's not the cause. So in other words, it is probably safe to drink in moderation, but not to drink to excess. And again, I'll show you a table that has some more figures and it talks about drinking to excess. What it comes down to is that things can be safe, but it doesn't mean that safe things have no risk. And it, things in life are always a balance, but actually some of the time we just don't know.